So my name is Lucy, I'm an archaeological conservator, and you can tell by the glaringly huge logo that I work for MOLA. Um, and I'm here to talk about object first aid training specifically. Um, how did it sort of come about? Um, I joined MOLA about a year ago, almost to the day, and within the first week, my manager asked me, would you like to do a conservation toolbox? And I was like, you know, yeah, sure. What was I going to say? Uh, no. <laughs> I didn't realize at the time that that meant, you're the trained person now. Um, so I have done quite a lot of training within the institution, and it's kind of brought up some questions, and hopefully you'll leave today thinking, this is interesting. Um, so in my introduction, what I'm hoping to achieve today is to highlight the importance of communication, collaboration between conservation and field staff, uh, to pack and process finds as efficiently um, as possible, uh, to minimize your conservation costs, to debunk some conservation ideas, because people don't always really know what we do. And um, I think I've tried to do this by um, going through training, toolbox talks, support, just generally being there and giving advice. And I have never won a, lo a lab coach on site, just saying. That cat is just, you know, ridiculous. Um, so what I'm going to try and walk you through today is um, a bit of what I do, just a tiny bit, um, and then what I mean by object first aid, because we can't do CPR on imposter research, and um, what are your benefits to being trained to receiving our training, and a little bit of what I do in MOLA and how I fit into the institution. So my conservation blurb is um, basically we aim to prevent and mitigate the deterioration process of collections, and to reveal details that are not necessarily visible when you excavate an object. We then, you might, have, you might know in your collections, objects continue to deteriorate, so we try to ensure that you have a stable environment for long-term safekeeping of your objects. Now, if you narrow down to archaeological con conservation, we also have on-site presence, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later. We provide advice, support, you can come to us for your questions, and we like to collaborate. And I know there is a bit of an idea that we are a bit like Smaug, and that we like to protect our objects, and that we don't let you touch them. Um, it's not true. Uh, but there are reasons we ask you to do things in a certain way, and I hope I'm showing you that. All right, so um, what I mean by first aid, object first aid, um, I haven't invented the term. It's based on a wonder wonderful book called First Aid for Finds by Watkinson and Neil. Um, being edited several times, there's a new one on the books coming out soon, watch this space. Um, I have tried to do a drawing because no one else has done one before and it was very not, really not helpful. Um, this kind of illustrates your journey, the object journey underground. So you have your lovely object and it spends quite an amount of time, a considerable amount of time underground. And depending on the oxygen, the water, the temperature, the humidity, even the acidity of your soil, it will react in different ways. Most likely it will reach a kind of comfy state. When you, you come, when it's excavated, all of this is suddenly exposed to outside water, to oxygen, which is bacteria, micro, microbes, and then the light and the heat, and your object is suddenly going to be like, oh my god, what's going on? Um, so... And that can be really incredibly fast, um, as you, might, you will see in a bit. Um, my definition of object first aid is an action of mitigation or interrupting material deter deterioration temporarily until it can actually be stabilized. So this is where we aim to training uh, archaeologists because they are the first ones to find the objects and they are the first ones to excavate them. So. Very simple steps are taken to ensure that you know what you're doing when you come across an object. And this starts with your bare environment. And the archaeologists know this better than anybody. They're working in this environment day in, day out. They know exactly what they've got. If they've got waterlogged, if they've got desiccated, mildly damp. Um, the materials the object is made of, it's really important to know what it's made of. And we're here to help with that. The issues associated with these materials, um, and how to eventually hold them until a conservator can get to them. Um, so, 
we say this because incorrect handling and packing can speed up deterioration and it can eventually have, leave you with no object at all. It's that quick. And the ability to decide what needs more immediate conservation, whereas compared to something that might be able to wait a few more months because it's just inherently stable, can save you time, money, and quite a lot of grief, just in general. Um, so moving on to um, kind of more object-based slides. Um, my aim today is not to tell you what to do, um, because that's a whole different presentation in itself and it takes quite a long time. I'm sort of hoping you'll walk out of here thinking, oh, I can keep that back in my mind and kind of process it. And so I will show you what can happen to some of the objects. And for that to happen, I'm going to bring you back to my turf, which is London, um, and kind of the environmental conditions of London. So London soil is quite anoxic in certain areas, which means there's very little or no oxygen, so no bacteria, and it's quite wet. And this is due to the River Thames and the fact that it rains just a tiny bit quite often. Um, and these are prime conditions for your organic materials to survive in the archaeological record. Uh, by organic material, I mean wood, textiles, leather, anything you can come across that basically was made from a living organism at some point. And they are, at MOLA, they're flagged as needing pretty immediate field conservation. And they are stored in a particular way, which is what we have, I think they're the pieces of leather. We store them like this because you have flagged them as, or well, an archaeologist has flagged them as being, as needing immediate treatment, but they might not come to us straight away. So we need to find ways to delay the deterioration process. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a few slides to kind of show you what happens. So wood, um, you can see, <laughs> it's quite visible what happens to air dried wood compared to what happens to treated wood. Um, and that is because your cells, this is healthy wood, your cells are all nice and aligned, and this is what happens when it air dries, it basically just claps and falls onto itself and shrinks. Um, another example will be leather. Um, you can see there's a change in colour, there's warping, it's all dry, hard, and not much you can do at this point, compared to treated leather, which has kept its more distinctive brown, treat, um, tanned leather. And you can see more surface detail, which is more useful for a specialist. Um, finally, this is one I like because you've got a bit of bone here, and then a bit of ivory, and a tiny bit of tortoiseshell. And you can immediately see that your bone is fine, it's air dried quite nicely, your ivory is split. And at this point, there's not much you can do for it anymore. And the tortoiseshell is trying to completely call it fluff. It's fluffy. Um, yeah, I apologise for a slightly wordy slide, so I was trying to get to 20. <laughs> um, so, training. So what would I typically do in a training session? Um, I would go through your deterioration mechanisms and kind of highlights which are more... Just go through the basics with what the object, uh, the archaeologists are facing. Then you'll go material by material, quick ID check, sort of be able to distinguish between maybe ivory and bone, be able to tell which is leather, which is fabric, um, some tips, tricks for handling and packing. We'll, go, we'll usually go through the examples that the archaeologists find on site, if they have anything specific that comes across more often, and lifting and handling, and finally packing to halt the process. Um, you can get further training included. Um, this slide is, I have recently become made aware of Dungeons and & Dragons, and I aspire to be a dungeon master. And so when I was thinking about how, <laughs> how to best describe what I was trying to put across was proficiency. So if you do the training, uh, hopefully what you'll come up with is object for state proficiency. Um, and you will be able to identify materials or narrow down possibilities. Because ultimately, if you can tell this is ivory or bone and you're not sure, then you'll treat it maybe as ivory and it doesn't matter which one is which because it will be preserved. And once you know which one it is, or you think you know, you can anticipate the known issues. You might remember that leather crackles and shrinks when it air dries, so you'll think, ah, well, this is what I need to be made aware of. Then you can determine optimal preservation requirements. So you'll think, 
If it's leather, then I'll put it in a pack of water and I will send it on its way to be someone else's problem. And then you end up with a lovely finished article. Um, your object is ready to go, it's packed, and it hopefully has halted the deterioration process and then it's our problem. Um, so your potential benefits in terms of taking training is bridging gaps or setting training as you require. You can set up guidelines to speed up fines packing, processing and storage, gaining time. Um, you can stabilize fines on site, um, or you can, sorry, you stabilize fine and have an on-site presence to minimize conservation work and costs, which is great, you save money. Um, prioritize the fines, because if you're able to tell this needs more work, rather than this doesn't work, then again, you're saving time and money because you can just shift through your objects depending on what needs work or not. And we can then, if we have this early link with the archaeologists, we can anticipate the site's need better, the better and maximize the efficiency in terms of estimating the time and the costs that we'll be putting through to you. And it's also quite, it's, it, it's usually come in handy to have this link because you have someone to go for advice. If you don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, you have someone to rely on. And it's just, it's just I love being on site. So every time I get an email saying, can you come on site? I say, yes, yes, I will come on site. Um, finally, just really wrapping up quickly, this is how we fit in in conservation at MOLA. We try to fit in in pretty much every step of your work stages during an excavation. So project planning we're working on, we're trying to find where we're missing the gaps. Uh, field conservation, what the unstable materials I would have mentioned. And we also go on site um, to do more delicate work. Um, it's tremendously fun. Um, assessment at work, analysis of work and reporting. Um, we also, we have a role in pretty much any stage. Um, and then, just training, we'll offer handling training, we'll offer material ID, which I have to do in a couple of weeks, object first aid, um, toolboxes and CPD toxics, and we're generally found on the phone or an email. Um, more useful references, if you're interested and you want to read a bit more about it, uh, first aid for finds I mentioned is great, it is aimed at archaeologists, um, but it is a bit dated, as I said, watch the space. Um, Historic England website has a really great guidelines uh, PDF on waterlogged organics, just how to treat them, how to pack them, if you're not sure where to get contacts. And English Heritage website has a conservation section, it's a bit more geared towards um, historic houses, but it has some interesting information about how to store your collections in the long term. Um, a few final thoughts um, that I'm just kind of gathering together, I have to read all of it. Um, we, we, I think it's really important, I found as I was training archaeologists that they just know that we're here um, just so they can go for advice, but also they're the ones, as I said, they're getting their hands on the objects first. So if they know how to do it, in inherently everything goes faster. So deterioration of uh, materials is quick, so confidence is key in making those first safe decisions. And you can get this confidence by getting training and inherently you're reducing costs and making your work more efficient, maybe adding value in reference to this morning um, presentations. And we really think that it's just sometimes useful to have this contact um, with someone that just can get you, say you, it's not a big problem, this is what you have to do and this is how you do it. So um, this is it, thank you very much for listening. Um, I, don't really, I believe there's an Instagram now for Mola, um, recent, but it's not updated yet.